everybody, and welcome to Resistance Recovery. I am very excited to have with me author and researcher Don Latin, who's the author of numerous books. Um, the two that I have read are Distilled Spirits, which is about Bill Wilson's relationship with Lois Huxley and Gerald Hurd. Um, this is a fantastic book. If you're an AA historian, it should be on your shelf. And the other one is Changing Our Minds, Psychedelic Sacraments and the New Psychotherapy. So Don is kind of uh, right in the crosshairs <laughs> of two very interesting topics that are getting a lot more um, attention of late. So maybe just a little bit about yourself and how you came to write both of those books. Sure. Well, thanks for having me on the podcast. Uh, great to talk to you, Pierce. Um, well, I was uh, most of my life I was a newspaper reporter. Um, I worked for many years as a, a religion and spirituality writer at the San Francisco Chronicle. And um, but I always was interested in the kind of the spiritual counterculture around the 1960s and what came out of that. A big part of which was the psychedelic era. Um, so that's always been an interest of mine. And so my early books were kind of about the kind of spiritual legacy of the whole 60s scene. Uh, it was a book called Following Our Bliss. So that's how I got started kind of writing about psychedelics was as a newspaper reporter. Um, you know, I did lots of stories about psychedelics over the years, including stories about the, you know, the CIA, you know, the nefarious CIA research back in the back in the uh, 50s, which was just first coming out in the 1970s. And I wrote about, you know, the Native American church's struggle to make sure that peyote was, was legal in their, in their uh, rituals and yeah, very, various things over the years. Um, then I, in 2010, uh, I published a book called The Harvard Psychedelic Club, which is really the first, you mentioned two of the books, but that's kind of the first one in a kind of a trilogy I've written over the last dozen years. And Harvard Psychedelic Club was a group biography of, of Timothy Leary, uh, Ram Dass, who was known as Richard Alpert back in the Harvard days, uh, Houston Smith and Andrew Weil. And that was kind of looking at the psychedelic 60s through the, those, those guys' eyes. And that book did really well. It was the one book, I've published six books, but that was the one that really was, a, it was a bestseller and did really well. Uh, Harper Collins published it. And so after that, um, I decided I wanted to do another group biography because I really liked that form, the group mm -hmm. biography form. Mm -hmm. And I knew there was a good story, uh, sort of a, really a, it came out after Harvard Psychedelic, but it was really a prequel in terms of the timeline of the of three guys who really set the stage for the 60s uh, renaissance of psychedelics. And that's Aldous Huxley, uh, the British writer, uh, Bill Wilson, co-founder of AA, and Gerald Hurd, who most people probably haven't heard of, but he was very influential in a lot of ways back in the 40s and 50s. He was an Anglo-Irish uh, writer, mystic philosopher. So uh, I, wrote, I was going to just write a straight biography, but then the, the publisher of that book, which was University of California Press, uh, they send out my proposal to uh, like experts in the field, like academic publications do that. And they said, well, this is interesting, but let's make Don Latin the fourth character in this mm. book. Because mm. I mentioned something in, in the preface about my own recovery. And, but I had no intention of making myself a character in, in the book because I'm, I was kind of still old school journalist, you know, like I is a dirty word, you know, it's not about me, uh, mm -hmm. not about myself. So that was a bit of a challenge to do that. And I felt, you know, a little uncomfortable, like putting myself in the same story of these three guys I didn't know. They were my grandfather's generation. Um, but uh, the, my editor at UC Press kind of insisted and I went along with it. And um, so that's kind of how that book came about in that form, that a mix of memoir, kind of a mix of a recovery memoir, a newspaper memoir, and a group biography of these three, three characters. It works. It does. <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny. It's it. Once I started writing it, you know, I I, I couldn't even imagine how to do it right at first. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it. Some people said it really humanizes the other the book, and you know, you, people want to know where the author's coming from, you know. So um, yeah, I think it did work in the end. But I was kind of dragging well, for a lot of dreaming. <laughs> 
for for a lot of readers, I think it um, you know, for somebody like me, I identify with you, you know, especially around the '60s and the psychedelics and the cultural shifts that are sort of post post Bill Wilson, and um, you know, you kind of bring us into relationship to our legacy in some sense. So it was really it was a marvelous book. Great. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. And then finally, changing our minds. Yeah. So changing our minds. Um, actually, after Harvard Psychedelic Club came out, which was in uh, early 2010, uh, this uh, so-called psychedelic renaissance or psychedelic research renaissance that's really getting a lot of attention now, that was really just starting to take off. I mean, it goes all the way back to the 90s, but it was they were finally gaining some traction around 20, 2009, 2010. And I thought about writing that book, uh, Changing Our Minds, which looks at this new, this research now that's going on now. But uh, because uh, I really did enjoy writing a group biography with Harvard Psychedelic Club, and it did do well, I thought, well, first I'll go back and do a you know a prequel. So, um, so anyway, but the, so that sort of delayed for a few years doing Changing Our Minds, and in the meantime, you know, there'd been. Uh, there's been a lot of positive uh, results from these research studies. They're using MDMA, psilocybin uh, to treat depression, addiction, and other mood disorders. Um, and so I just knew there was a really good story there that really hadn't been told yet about kind of the backstory of how the underground psychedelic therapy movement was kind mm -hmm. of coming above ground and uh, trying to get legitimacy from folks like the US Food and Drug Administration and <laughs> research centers and universities and medical schools. and uh, and I knew some people that were you know, involved in the underground therapy movement for years. So um, I, so I, I just knew it was a great, a great story there. And um, but I also wanted to look at the kind of the renaissance around um, ayahuasca and its other sacred plant medicines. And there's an, a, there's a chapter there on addiction, um, yes. but it's kind of an overview uh, of the whole scene. So that came out in 20. 17, uh, the title was Changing Our Minds. And then a little more than a year later, Michael Pollan came out with his book, uh, Changing Our Minds, which became a huge success and kind of <laughs> kind of buried my book uh, because, you know, he's Michael Pollan and I'm not, you know, he's kind of a brand. Yeah. And, and, I mean, I know Michael, you know, we're both journalists and we both taught at the uh, uh, Journalism School of Berkeley. And so, but, uh, um, but anyway, so yeah, that's how Changing Our Minds came about. And a small pub publisher, a synergetic press, um, which uh, has done some other interesting books in this field. They published that. They're out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. So, Well, I guess what I kind of like to do is sort of go a little chronologically through the books in the sense of going back to Hurd and, and Huxley and them being the sort of they're the prequel in a way of the 60s right. renaissance and um and then how they got to know bill wilson and what that experience was like what that that Malou was like so maybe i think the audience probably knows quite a bit about huxley as the author of the doors of perception and brave new world but how about this figure of gerald hurd yeah, well, that's actually the genesis of, of uh, Distilled Spirits was really more Gerald Hurd mm. in a way. Uh, I kept hearing the name Gerald Hurd pop up in different ways. Uh, I mean, I remember one time I was, I was still working as a newspaper reporter and I was doing a story, I don't know, the 25th anniversary of uh, Esalen Institute at Big Sur, which is uh, sort of the granddaddy of the human potential movement uh, groups from the 70s uh, uh, retreat center. And Michael Murphy, one of the founders of that, you know, told me that uh, this guy Gerald Hurd was was really the inspiration behind it. Uh, Esalen started in like the early '60s, and that Hurd had this retreat center called Trabuco College, which people had forgotten about down in Southern California. And so I, I filed that away. And then um, I was interviewing Houston Smith one time, the scholar of world religions, who mm -hmm. uh, told me that you know he became really interested in all this through the writings of Gerald Hurd back in the 40s. And that's how he met uh, Aldous Huxley. Uh, 
So Gerald Hurd was, um, he was actually pretty popular and well known between the wars, between World War I and II. And he wrote, you know, oh, I don't know, 10 or 20 books, uh, some of which are pretty difficult to get through. But he also wrote like, you know, science fiction novels and, you know, all kinds of stuff. I mean, he was, mm. he was a very eclectic writer. And um, so he met Huxley when they were still living in England back in the, the 20s. And he's the guy who actually got Aldous Huxley interested in kind of philosophy and spirituality and religion and uh, eventually psychedelics. Because um, Huxley in his early writings you know, with Brave New World and before that in the 30s, he was a you know, pretty cynical character. I mean, a social satirist and wasn't really interested in religion. And so it was Gerald Hurd that really got him kind of on that track. And Hurd and Huxley came to the States together uh, in the late 30s thought they were just going to be on a speaking tour. They were actually pacifists. They were on a pacifist speaking tour, wow. uh, which was not a popular thing to be as World War II was getting going um, in England and elsewhere. But they came on a, a, a pacifist lecture tour, and they wound up staying basically the rest of their lives and living, living mostly in Southern California. Um, so, um, so that's... Gerald Hurd, and um, in some ways Hurd was uh, in the 50s, uh, he was a bit of a proto Timothy Leary. I mean, he was uh, uh, very excited about the spiritual potential of LSD, mainly LSD, in opening people's minds up to other dimensions of consciousness and reality and became uh, kind of a proponent of psychedelic spirituality, but in a very different way than Leary and kind of a quieter way where they were mm -hmm. kind of turning on the thought leaders. Mm -hmm. and we call them influencers now in another, another mm -hmm. context, but, and that this consciousness would kind of ripple down through the society. So Huxley, it, 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 <laughs> Heard and Huxley really thought that the common man wasn't ready for this, you know. Right, it's sort of a clash of the Anglo, Anglo elite meeting American populism or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Huxley was very careful. Like he, he, he wrote about. So I mean, he wrote. You know, he wrote the Doors of Perception in 1950. Uh, his experiences in 53 came out in 54. But he like had a policy. He wouldn't talk about it on television. You know, for instance, I wouldn't talk mm -hmm. about it on television. Um, so anyway, so that's how those two kind of come together. And then Bill Wilson was, uh, you know, the founder of AA, which started in the 30s. Uh, he was a big fan of Gerald Hurd's writing. And uh, so he sought Gerald Hurd out and on Wilson's first trip to Southern California, um, you know, in the 1940s, he met Hurd and they forged a, a lifelong friendship and correspondence. And, um, and through Hurd, uh, Bill Wilson and Matt Huxley. So that's how the three of them kind of came together and ultimately in the 50s, experiment a lot with, with LSD and other psychedelics. Uh, in Wilson's case, you know, uh, Wilson was interested in its potential to help alcoholics in their mm -hmm. recovery and having the spiritual awakening that they talk about in the, in the 12 steps. So if, I'm, if I recall, um, Hurd and Huxley shared a strong interest in Vedanta, although that would be stronger with Hurd than Huxley. So they were definitely engaged in consciousness altering spiritual practices, meditative practices. And then the LSD comes on top of that. Yeah, yeah. They, they had, a, and I wouldn't say they were, they, they had a brief period where they were really into Vedanta. They were really interested in uh, sort of parapsychology, uh, you know, and, uh, non-ordinary states of reality, but like, you know, sort of seances and mediums and, you know, telepathy and that sort of thing. They were, the, both, they were both, and so was Wilson. They were all interested in sort of yeah. scientifically proving that this other dimension, this metaphysical dimension existed. And uh, some of it was, I, you know, kind of like, would, I would sort of think of it as sort of flaky stuff, you know, like seances and things like that. And, you know, table rattling and sp spoon bending and all of that, you know? Mm -hmm. They were interested in that. And so was Bill Wilson, by the way. Um, yeah. That's actually how they got interested in psychedelics. It was kind of through that interest in, in psychic research. Um, but the Vedanta thing, they both, because Huxley and Hurd both wound up in, in Hollywood or LA, 
they hooked up with the Vedanta Temple in Hollywood, which was very, very big and popular in the 20s and 30s. I mean, the Vedanta movement was huge, like from late 19th century until about the 30s, and it started kind of dying out. It's still around, but um, so it was sort of a brief period, uh, you know, I'd say the 40s and 50s, early 50s, when they were interested in Vedanta, but uh, Huxley didn't like, it sort of had some cultish aspects that Huxley didn't like, and and Heard too eventually kind of had a falling out in some ways with them and went on his own direction. Of course, they weren't uh, thrilled when they got interested in psychedelics and started writing and proselytizing for psychedelics. The Vedanta people weren't crazy about that, but they had already kind of were sort of going their separate ways. Uh, I think the audience, um, I mean, uh, it's, it's easy to forget that this interest in parapsychology, which, which like psychedelics, is coming back again. Um, but there was J.B. Ryan and the Parapsychological Society. And I was really amazed to find out that William James had spent pretty much the last 30 of, years of his life engaged in that kind of research. Yeah. yeah so yeah. It, it was in the air. It was definitely it was, in the air. It was, it was sort of, it was almost like more acceptable in kind of academic or not, it was never really that acceptable in pure academic context, but it was definitely, well, it really was pop. It's really started in the 19th century with spiritualism right. and all that. Um, but it was, yeah, it was at least as popular, you know, in the twenties as it was in like later in the sixties. And then maybe now it's never really gone away. There's always been a lot of interest in that, but uh, for, you know, since the 19th century. And it's interesting that that would be the thing that Bill Wilson would have uh, interest in really right up till the end. Whereas yeah, yeah. you got a little, you know, you got shut down on the psychedelics. Um, yeah. Well, the people at AA weren't crazy about his interest in parapsychology either. You know, I mean, they were, I mean, Bill Wilson was interesting because he was a, I, I call him an enthusiast. You know, he would get onto something and he would just get totally into it and think it was going to save the world. I mean, for a while it was vitamin B therapy. I mean, he was right. totally convinced that that one time he said he thought he'd be remembered for that more than AA. <laughs> uh, you know, and and the psychic stuff he was always interested in. I mean, they used to have in the the Stepping Stones house in in New York. Right. You know, they used to have they had what they call them spook sessions and yeah. seances. And uh, and he had a, I think it's a sister in law who was a psychic. And uh, yeah, they, well, the three of them are all really interested in that. I mean, in fact, the first stop that Huxley and Heard made in the states was the J.D. Ryan Psychic Research uh, kind of his center, in, I think it was North Carolina or someplace. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I was uh, in my early recovery. I was often down in that Bedford Hills area, and mm -hmm. so this will be in the '90s. And I did have an opportunity to visit what they called the person who was going to take me there, what they called the Spook Room. Right. So right. it was where all the seances and such happened. I declined, thinking I could do it later. And then years later, when I tried to do it, they didn't give access to it. Oh. Uh. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, that's actually, that house is where I found this uh, famous uh, second letter, not so famous, but uh, this letter to Young was in the library in that house. That's how I discovered that. Wow. We, we can talk about it later if you want, but. Yeah, uh, I would really yeah, like that. That's where I found it, in, in the, actually in that house, uh, upstairs in the, uh, it's like a library in the attic. <laughs> <laughs> that's wild. You'd <laughs> yeah. think that'd be an archives, uh, you know, University of Toronto. well, they didn't want it to be found. I mean, that we, yeah, that's a long story. We can talk about it, but yeah, yeah. So, some of the um, figures around Heard Huxley and Wilson that were joining them in this kind of research, some of the names. You mean in the LSD? Uh, yeah, that would actually join them in the sessions. Yeah. Um, well, they were they were turning on a lot of people in both New York and, and and LA, you know, like Hollywood people. I mean, either directly or through other people that you know they they got interested. I mean, people like ultimately like Cary Grant and you know Jack Nicholson were turning on. If you, you can trace that back to Heard in the, mm -hmm. uh, through a psych psychiatrist named Oscar Yaniger, who I think got into it through Heard and and all those guys. Um, Probably one of the most influential people that Gerald Heard turned on, the couple was uh, Henry Luce, who was the head of the Time Life Publishing Empire, which was, you know, 
Time and Life magazine were huge back, of course, in the 50s. It was kind of like being, you know, a combination of Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg now. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, very influential. And uh, so he turned, and, and, and Luce's wife, Claire Booth Luce, who was a power in her own right and a member, of Congress, just, member of Congress later on, uh, you know, so. And well, your back. description of her makes her sound like, I don't know what, a siren, um, an utterly driven, um, a force to be reckoned with at any rate. Yeah, yeah. And she had, you know, she had some emotional difficulties and Heard was, you know, and spiritual kind of quest she was going through that Heard helped her with, 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 with psychedelics. And, uh, um, but, you know, I, I think one of the reasons that some of the early media coverage of the psychedelic of LSD in the, like I said, the 50s was so positive was be, partly, I think, because, you know, the publisher was sort of a sympathetic, Henry Luce, because he'd been, and he understood it, actually. Most people didn't, weren't really, weren't really down on it yet. The whole controversy of Leary in the 60s and all the craziness of the hippies and all that hadn't happened yet. But Luce uh, understood what what it was and thought it was important. And um, so, you know, time and life did some, you know, so sort of landmark stories on it, uh, including on the magic mushrooms in Mexico. They, you know, Gordon Wasson wrote a, wrote a big piece in Life Magazine in, I think, 57 about the magic mushrooms of Mexico, and which was very influential in getting people interested in that and starting the whole, you know, kind of hippie trail later on down to Mexico and South America, but which is, which is now huge, you know, the psychedelic yeah. tourism, right? Yeah. But it really dates back to that Life Magazine article in 57. And there was even, they even did a fairly favorable article on the young Leary. Yeah, I guess they did. Let me think. They they did some. Yeah, they did um, uh, some favorable coverage about the good so-called Good Friday experiment, which was Leary was kind of loosely involved with, which was um, giving L uh, actually psilocybin to seminary students to see if they were to see if the religious experience people were having were quote authentic spiritual experiences. So they did a double blind placebo study with uh, uh, seminary students half got a psilocybin half got a placebo and it was really the first study of its kind like that and which are now being re re replicated uh like at johns hopkins and other places in this this new wave of research one of the most intriguing characters you write about in that group of folks was um i hope i get the name right uh humphrey ormond is that it humphrey osmond oh humphrey osmond yeah yeah, yeah humphrey osmond yeah, so Humphrey Osmond was the guy who turned on uh, Huxley to mescaline, uh, his first psychedelic experience. And Humphrey Osmond was a was a psychiatrist, uh, worked at a mental hospital way up in Saskatchewan. I mean, way up in the frozen, you know, tundra of Canada. And uh, he was doing research with psychedelics with mental patients and and also with alcoholics, hardcore alcoholics, uh, and having some success. And he had written up a paper in you know, some obscure journal that Huxley found, because that's what Huxley did. He sat around <laughs> reading obscure journals, uh, things he was interested in, in his study in the Hollywood Hills there, and invited Humphrey Osmond to come down and uh, lead him on a mescaline trip so he could experience that himself, which was the basis for the book uh, Doors of Perception, which was, of course, sort of the first real influential book in the English language that got people interested in this. Because, you know, Huxley was probably the most best known writer in the English language in the world then. I mean, he was really well known and popular, influential. So. Um, I knew I had it wrong. Osmond's interesting. The guy that intrigued me that you wrote about was Al Hubbard. Oh, oh Hubbard, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the guy who, yeah. Hubbard, yeah, right, yeah. There's actually a book coming out uh, I think in a few months, uh, a guy in Seattle named Brad Holton about Hubbard and some really interesting stuff. I wrote a foreword for it. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that's that's coming. Yeah, he was sort of the original kind of, I, I said that, I said that um, you know, Gerald Hurd was kind of a proto Leary, but Al Hubbard was even in some ways more so. And Hubbard was a very mysterious character. He had you know, links to the OSS, which became the CIA. And 
he you know, goes all the way back to the, to the prohibition era where he was working as both a uh, kind of a treasury agent, you know, busting bootleggers and working as a bootlegger at the same time. <laughs> that's it. This, yeah. all, this is all in this new book, which is really interesting. Um, that, that, I mean, Hubbard's backstory, you know, way back into the 20s and 30s, what he was into. And uh, anyway, he somehow had access to a lot of LSD in the 50s and could take it across borders. And, uh, you know, uh, exactly what his role was, if any, with the some of the nefarious CIA work is still not really clear. I think even after he, this book? Yeah, even after, well, I think I, 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 I the book kind of concludes as I did uh, that, he did have some connection to the CIA or the precursor to the CIA, but he was always considered a loose cannon. So he was never really trusted by, uh, he kind of worked both sides, both with, during prohibition and then later in the psychedelic era. Uh, and, and so uh, he really thought LSD had a potential to uh, spiritually enlighten the world. I mean, he really, so he wasn't looking at it like a chemical weapon or some thing to use for torturing people like the CIA was, he actually thought you know, that it was a positive spiritual, uh, you know, medicine that could be used to really help people. So he really didn't, he said, he said like the CIA work stinks, you know, they're killing people. And so he was, you know, kind of a, like I said, a, a loose cannon in that world. Um, but he, he, you know, what's so interesting about it all is that he, he sort of epitomizes the trickster element that goes with these substances. You know, yeah. here's, here's this guy who's kind of at the crossroads who can go his entree into all the different worlds, you know, and then you have Leary who kind of, you know, had some interesting connections with the CIA himself. Yeah. And then you have somebody like Bill Wilson and who in a way is, you know, he's sort of the prototypical Goldwater Republican business guy, and yet he's walking through all these different doors and negotiating all this. So yeah, it just uh, Hubbard. Hubbard was very right wing, very right wing politically too. I mean, but and so was Wilson. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just so interesting that there's this moment in time before the '60s where you can kind of start seeing the cultural shakeup you know, beginning to happen. You can see the deeper, the deeper rumblings starting to happen. Yeah, what happened in the 60s was just so, you know, uh, powerful, those social movements of the 60s that, you know, with, with, you know, starting with, kind of starting with Leary and then Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters on the West Coast and just the whole hippie explosion and psychedelic kind of counterculture. And the, so psychedelics got linked in with like the new left and the counterculture and the youth revolution and all that. And people forget that there's this whole other history, yeah. really the early history of it, which didn't have any of those associations, right? Uh, yeah. So was it the bad press that will come out about psychedelics in the 60s that leads uh, Bill Wilson to get in hot water with AA? No, that, no, no, no. I, 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 he was, he was in hot water from the beginning. I mean, that you, you can, and he, you know, in the 50s, I mean, when he was, you know, he wasn't like talking about this publicly so much, right? But you can go back and I, which I do in Distilled Spirits, I go back and look at the letters that he's writing about it, you know, and he's writing about the reaction that other leaders in AA are having to it. Um, you know, one, one other AA person said, criticized Wilson, he takes one pill to see God and another to calm his nerves, because <laughs> he was also, you know, into tranquilizers because he had you know he had a lot of emotional problems he was he suffered from major depression and actually the, the reason that bill wilson got interested in psychedelics was not to get sober he'd been sober since the 30s he got interested in psychedelics partly because he thought it could help other alcoholics you know have the spiritual awakening of the 12 steps but for him personally he thought it would he hoped it would help him with his depression you know, you have to remember this was before there were all these new you know medications for and, and antidepressants so um, uh, he also ho hoped that it would help him stop smoking, which was the addiction that killed him in the end. You know, he died of tobacco related diseases in the early 70s. So, so that's why uh, Bill was 
personally interested in, 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 in psychedelics. And, you know, in both cases, they didn't really work for him. I mean, he, no. didn't, he didn't stop smoking and his, it helped a bit with his depression, but he still suffered from depression after that. Um, but he thought it was positive in, in that in one sense, but. And you mention a very um, kind of maverick figure uh, who very few people know about, but I actually knew people that knew him, uh, Tom Powers, who. Powers, yeah, yeah. And my connections say that Powers was actually with Wilson in some of these LSD sessions, but how, in fact, there's, um, the transcripts of LSD sessions with Tom Powers. Um, and I think Sidney Cohen was there too. There were a bunch of people. Yeah, the transcript that I'm familiar with was, I don't know if Tom Powers was at that session. I don't think he was, but it was actually the first, the, 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 the sort of the famous and kind of funny one actually. I just talked about how it didn't work with his smoking, right? The Wilson's first session with LSD uh, a trip was in August of 1956 at the VA hospital in LA mm -hmm. where uh, Sidney Cohen, who was an early researcher was, uh, was doing work with uh, LSD and uh, you know, sort of the basic research with LSD and Heard was part of that too. They were, Heard was friends with that, with uh, Cohen, Cohen. So the first trip Wilson had Sidney Cohen was like the medical supervisor and, you know, the uh, researcher and, and Gerald Hurd was his, basically his kind of his guide. So it was like the three, I think it was the three of them. I don't know if Tom Powers was involved. He may have been there. I'm not sure, but yeah, I'm thinking of something in New York, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Later on in New York, they had a salon. Um, yeah. Where Powers was involved and, you know, the, the head of uh, one of the heads at Harper, help Harper and Row publishers, you know, some, you know, some real powerful people, some, theologians and you know interesting some businessmen were involved in those sessions but yeah that first that first session the the, the transcript says it says that something like you know there's, it's like a timeline right so bill's coming on to the lsd and first thing he's, he starts laughing and he says <laughs> people shouldn't take themselves so damn seriously and he keeps <laughs> laughing you know and uh, he had that kind of silly kind of moment you often sometimes have it with a mushroom trip or an LSD trip, right? Everything kind of lightens up and then it gets heavier. And, and then something like, you know, I forget exactly the details, but like 1 p.m., he says, I have no need for tobacco. And then 2.32, asks for a cigarette. Right. <laughs> so, so the the the, the non-smoking uh, cure didn't work too well in his case, but <laughs> and I find it curious that later powers will suggest to Wilson that your depression is, has everything to do with your infidelity. Right, right. They had, that was uh, that's my. I didn't get into that too deeply, but my understanding. I talked to. I think it was his Powers' son. Is there? He have a son. Tom who Powers got, Jr. Yeah, he's since deceased, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. I talked to him for Distilled Spirits, and um, yeah, they started. The, what's it called? All addictions. Anonymous? All addicts anonymous. All yeah. addicts anonymous. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it was over Bill's uh, womanizing. Yeah. And relationship with. Um, Name's escaping me. Helen uh, Wynn. Wynn, yeah. Long time affair with Helen Wynn, who actually was included in his will, uh, even. So. so, one area that doesn't come up um, very often is uh, the fact now, I don't think it really makes any difference in terms of Bill's experience, but that at the Towns Hospital in 34, he was administered a tincture of belladonna at regular intervals in the hours or days leading up to his spiritual awakening. Right. And do we know if Bill Wilson ever put those two things together? I mean, were those, did he link those things that the experience in Towns Hospital was somehow not unlike what he would experience with Heard and company? Yeah. Well, he definitely linked the experience experience of the psychedelic experience and and that founding revelation of AA whether he he actually said I mean I interviewed um uh, when I interviewed Houston Smith who's also since passed away Houston had a conversation with Bill 
uh, Wilson about that shortly after it happened. And Wilson really? called, yeah, yeah, uh, in St. Louis. Uh, and Bill called it a dead ringer were the words he used, a dead ringer for what he, his LSD experience was a dead, in the 50s, was a dead ringer for what happened to him at Towns Hospital in the 30s. Now, whether he, he was thinking that the Towns Hospital was induced by Belladonna or the, that sort of cocktail that they gave, but it's part of this, called it the Towns Lambert Cure. I don't know actually how, what, I, th I think he thought that was a, you know, just a kind of a revelation that he had for whatever reason, wasn't really chemically induced. And I, it may have been a factor in it, but, um, you know, oh, you, yeah, have to remember, you have to remember that he was hitting bottom, right? I mean, he was yeah, a hard yeah. hitting bottom and you, 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 yeah, the DTs, you have hallucinations <laughs> anyway. Right. Right? And, and, and the other thing about, interesting about that revelation was it's, and I write about this in Distilled Spirits is, you know, his, he had a grandfather who was a notorious drunk who had a revelation, you know, part of the kind of temperance movement in the, you know, late 19th century who told this story about this white light and these two personages on this mountaintop in Vermont. And, and then he goes down to the, this is the grandfather, goes down to the congregational church in Vermont and says he's cured of alcoholism. I mean, it's very much like the, yeah. the story that Bill Wilson tells. So I think he's like, a lot of things are going on with that founding revelation for AA and is he's hitting bottom. Yeah, there's maybe he's, these herbs are, that he's taking in this cure have something to do with it. He's thinking of his grandfather's story. Um, he's, he got Ebby, all, he's got Ebby bringing he's got Ebby, him. He's got Ebby Thatcher uh, uh, who, has turned, who is encouraging him to read uh, William James book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, which is talking about spiritual states like this. And there's this proto-evangelical thing in the background from the Oxford group, like there was with his grandfather. Right, uh, right. So I think all those things, uh, you know, some people think, uh, oh, he, the, the, you know, drugs had nothing to do with, they get, get upset when you say that these, you know, uh, like uh, Henbane or Belladonna may have had something to do with his vision. And you know, my take on it is it doesn't really matter. You know, no, mine too. What did, what did he do with the vision? Well, right. he started AA and he helped thousands of people, right? Get sober. Yeah. And you know, by by the fruits you shall judge it, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of how I look at it. Same thing, like, you know, people still talk about, well, is a spiritual experience you have on psychedelic drug authentic? I think the experience is authentic. The same thing is probably going on in the brain. But the question is, what do you do with it? Does it make you a more aware, compassionate person, you know, uh, in your real life? That's to me, that's, that's right. What, the whole traits, not states thing. Right, right. Which was a Houston uh, Smith line that it's more. Yeah, you're interested in, in traits rather than uh, states as in altered states of consciousness. Yeah, because I think there's no doubt that you can you can't really say that Bill Wilson did not walk away from pounds. Uh, he walked away with a caress. He walked away with a gift, and yeah, that yeah. gift enabled him to touch the lives of other people, in a in a spiritual sense, which he certainly didn't have anything like that in his life prior. To that. Exactly. Amen, brother. I'm totally agree with that. Yeah. So, did Wilson really reluctantly stop uh, end the salon, if you will? I mean, was that no, part of I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think anybody does. Um, he stopped. He stopped writing. I mean, he never publicly talked about it, right? But you don't see it in letters after, like, I mean, he 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 did know. He met Leary. You know, he corresponded with Leary before Leary. The whole Leary thing exploded at well, Harvard. That was a dangerous thing to do. Which was sixty three. Yeah, he was actually trying to get Leary to join AA. <laughs> Because Larry, Larry's problem drug was not LSD; it was alcohol. I mean, Larry was Larry was an alcoholic. Really? I mean, I had a personal experience with that with him. Uh, but uh, but I, I I think what happened. My sense is that once LSD got this re bad reputation, and psychedelics got um, you know associated with the counterculture and hippies and the new left and you know the youth movement the anti-war movement the civil rights movement, all that stuff got all mushed together in the 60s 
I, I think Bill probably, I don't know if he, I, I don't know if he stopped taking psychedelics, but I, I think those things kind of trailed off just because it was just, people's attitude about it was really, had really changed drastically in like 62, 63, 64, it started changing. So um, I have a feeling that he kind of titrated down, you know, sorry, that he kind of stopped, but we don't really know. We don't really know. And, you know, because he didn't die, he died in, he died, yeah, then he was sick later on in life. You know, he only died in 71, so it wasn't that many years left of his life, right? Yeah. So um, another figure who figures in this and well, at least in the genesis of AA in a big way, is Carl Jung. And Jung, famously in the big book, you know, here and there, alcoholics have what are called vital spiritual experiences. So he he attempted to treat Bolin Hazard, and Hazard would find his way to the Oxford group and so on. But Bill Wilson never contact is this correct bill wilson never reached out to Jung until 1961 at the very end of Jung's life yeah the uh are you are you hearing me okay i am okay because i'm for some reason your sound stopped coming i can hear you through the i'm not i can hear you but it really got faint so as long as you can hear me that's fine okay um I don't think Wilson, well, the first that we know, I think, that Wilson, of Wilson reaching out to Jung, there's, there were, he basically wrote two letters to Jung and Jung answered the first one. So that was in 61, uh, shortly before Jung died. So um, I think he was really, that, that's, I think that's the first evidence we have of him actually trying to correspond with Jung that I know of. I think he was, I mean, they were interested in Jung, they read Jung, you know, all the way back to the 30s, I think. You know, in '40s, so they were some some of the lot of early AA people were really interested in Young as they were in William James. Um, but I, I think that's the only, that's the only correspondence that I know of was the, the the two letters that Wilson wrote to Young. I mean, just looking at it from this distance, it kind of looks like Bill has this realization: Oh my God, he's 86 years old. If I'm going to do this, I better do this. Kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know why. I think part of it, I think, was in the late fifties. You know, Bill was writing some stuff about the history of AA, and you know, kind of, they were they were thinking about a movie about it. They were, so they were they were kind of thinking about. By that point, they were kind of looking back at the history and and what the influences were early on, and and uh, you know, I mean, partly you know, Ebby Thatcher and Roland Hazard were kind of written out of the story in a way because they both relapsed right and right. Uh, and i mean they were in some ways the founders of of aa um but uh but you know they they weren't completely written out because bill tells that story of ebby thatcher you know i think i think it's even maybe it's in the big book or it's in something um uh one of the one of the histories that he wrote but uh, about how important you know they both were their stories were in aa the genesis of aa so let's get to this this second letter. So most rank and file, well, not rank and file, but most AA members who have an interest in history and so on and so forth are aware of the Wilson uh, right. Young correspondence and they're beautiful letters, right. really quite touching letters. Right. But you found a second letter. <laughs> this is a great story. Yeah. Okay, well, there, yeah, so uh, Bill uh, wrote to Young, let's see. Um, where's the, I got him out here because I can't remember all this off the top of my head. Well, anyway, the, the date isn't important, but Bill, anyway, Bill wrote, Bill wrote a letter to Young in, um, I guess it was 60, maybe late 60 or early 61. Uh, where he told, where he was asking Young if he remembered this patient named Roland Hazard, who was a kind of a childhood buddy of Thatcher and Wilson, I think, uh, a drinking buddy at some point. And uh, Roland Thatcher was a wealthy New England guy, a wealthy family. He went all the way back to Switzerland to try to get the cure for his alcoholism from Young. And 
And you know, one of the things that Young explained was that, you know, his craving for alcohol was really the spiritual thirst and that he had to like find some way of having union with God. And, you know, this whole, this idea that alcohol is really a, you're trying to fill up this kind of God shaped hole with alcohol. Right. And that's kind of the idea that, that, uh, that Young passed along to Roland Hazard. And he came back and after that gets involved with the Oxford group and starts uh, what becomes early version of AA. And so anyway, so Young, uh, Wilson writes to Young, said, do you remember this guy, Roland Hazard? You know, and, and he did. And so uh, Young answered. And um, so in the first letter that Wilson writes to Young, there's nothing about LSD, even though it was in the middle of this LSD period. He doesn't, he talks about the I Ching and spiritualism and so, but he doesn't talk about, doesn't mention psychedelics in the first, uh, Wilson's first letter to Young. Young answers and that's the famous letter that Young, you know, wrote to AA and to Bill. Um, you can see it on the wall sometimes at AA meetings. You know, I've seen it framed on the wow. wall at AA meetings. Yeah, the first- I never letter, have, that's great. The first letter the, of, of, of Young back to Wilson. Yeah. So then, uh, then Bill answered that, uh, answered Young with a longer letter, which never came out until actually, I think I was the first one to find it. Um, I think it had been talked about or maybe quoted from, mentioned, but no one had ever found the, that I know had found the letter. Um, so I, I did find the letter, somebody told me where to look and it was just in this, it was, I said before, it was at the the Stepping Stones house and was it Bedford, New Bedford, Bedford, Bedford Hills. Hills, Bedford Hills. Yeah. Outside of New York City. Uh, and there was a somebody said, well, look in that binder over there. So it was this beat up old like three ring binder with all this stuff in it, like, you know, with like, uh, you know, those plastic, what do you call them, covers you stick old letters in. Right. And in that is this letter which had been like, it was like mimeographed or photocopied so many times that some of it was kind of hard to read. And some of it actually looked like it had been whited out. Some wow. of the parts around, around the LSD thing. So I got my phone out, I took pictures of it, you know, and, um, and uh, so I can, I can read from it if you want. Um, I would like that, yes. Yeah, um, so, you know, he starts out, you know, thanking him. Wilson starts out thanking Young for his letter and talking about various things, uh, how important Young was in, you know, inspiring people early on in AA. And he says, um, talking about, you know, religion in AA and William James. And he says, many of us AAs, for example, have returned to the churches almost always with fine results. But some of us have taken other less orthodox paths. <laughs> Along with a number of friends, I find myself among the latter. So he's starting to talk, he's, he's, he's building up to talk about LSD, right? So, he's, so he's, then he talks about consciousness. Blah, 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 blah. He talks about psychic investigations, is about telepathy. He, here's like a few paragraphs about that. And then he starts mentioning LSD. And he says, then too, there is the development now coming on in the area of spiritual or mystical experiences which are triggered by the use of, then there's some lines that are whited out. <laughs> but then it picks up and says, these LSD experiences I think what he's saying is he's, he's, he's challenging the idea that these LSD experiences are always schizophrenic and dangerous, but the white out, white out part makes it, the beginning of the sentence is missing, right? Then he says, yet hard evidence has been accumulating for years that this is seldom the case, meaning that it leads to schizophrenia, right? Lysergic acid is virtually harmless and quite non-addictive. Some of my AA friends and I have taken the material frequently and with much benefit. Once in the experience, there is a great broadening and deepening and heightening of consciousness, which bears little or no relation to hallucination. More reality is seen and felt, not less. 
we have seen the whole range of valid spiritual experience uh, pre pre precipitated, precipitated in this manner. Then, later on, he says that he talks about this research that uh, is being done by Humphrey Osmond up in Canada. And he said this involves extremely difficult cases of alcoholics, right, who are uh, the, the excluded psychotics, but serious alcoholic cases. He says, Wilson says, quote, Alcoholics Anonymous gets about a 5% recovery rate in such cases, meaning really hardcore cases. But if these alcoholics were first preconditioned by LSD and then placed in the surrounding groups, the result is startling. Over the past three years, over 150 cases have been so treated by my dot, 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 friends as of this dot, then it's whited out again. <laughs> now I'm not 100% sure it was whited out because because it was the letter was in such bad shape, a lot of it's hard to read, but it looked like it had been whited out. So he's, I think he's gonna say what the recovery rate is for people that are preconditioned with LSD, but that's not in, that's gone. Now, some people have said it was like he said 50% or he said 15% or, you know, it might have been, it might have been whited out because he actually got that wrong. Like he might have like overstated the case and then somebody went, maybe he even whited it out. Who knows? Uh, then he's, then, he, then the next graph is my friends believe that LSD temporarily triggers a change in blood chemistry that inhibits or reduces ego, thereby enabling more reality to be felt and seen. The amount of LSD needed is extremely small and the material seems to be eliminated from the body before the experience begins. And he talks about other things about how it, he says, these LSD manifestations are deeply shocking to many theologians and even psychiatrists. He had a total of 50,000 administrations in the US and Canada during the past seven or eight years has resulted in virtually no harm and certainly large benefits to many. So anyway, that's basically it. You can see how positive he, he is about LSD. I mean, he was actually, uh, I mean, he even said uh, in another letter that he thought LSD was about as harmless as aspirin. I mean, you know, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's much more dangerous than aspirin psychologically. It's much more dangerous than aspirin. So, you know, in, in his enthusiasm, this is you see this in a lot of things with Bill right. Wilson. He, he right. sort of just, you know, he just I can't. can't it. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, that's the second letter to Jung, which, um, which I found. And so Jung never answers it. It's not clear whether Jung even read it because he got sick and died right around that time. Um, although we do know that Jung, from other letters to someone else, that Jung was not a big fan of psychedelics and was very down on it, actually. But um, so he probably would have probably challenged if he if he had answered. <laughs> He probably would have challenged. I would have challenged Bill on on the value of LSD. Who knows? But yeah. So if we fast forward to the mid seventies, there had been some research at Hopkins uh, with alcoholism. Stan Groff had done quite a bit of stuff. So by the time LSD and psychedelics get really shut down. There really was a fairly substantial documented uh, hospital setting record of successful treatment. Yeah, no, there was, there was. I mean, a lot of this early, I mean, they were stumbling around trying to figure out how to do it. You know, I mean, they hadn't really, they were, it was an experimental period and they made some but, but they, I think over the years, they discovered a way to use LSD for certain people. I mean, it certainly isn't for everyone. It's, you know, probably not for most people, but they were, they were figuring it out. And then it was all, it was all shut down in the, well, it started being shut down in the sixties, but by mid seventies, it was kind of completely shut down. And it wasn't just for uh, alcoholism or addiction. It was for depression and, um, of other you know, mood disorders. So it's the same stuff they're doing research on now, you know, it, it's like, it's like they're kind of reinventing the wheel now with all this new research that's going on. But, but
but the the standards are much tighter now, you know, and and the the studies are much better now than they were back then. You know, there was a looser period for drug research in all kinds of ways, right? So. You're frozen on the screen here. We... Are you back? Yeah, we're back. Okay, sorry. Um, you said we were talking about, um, you said there was some success and then you moved into discussing how it was also used with certain mood disorders. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Anyway, yeah, so it was shut down. Um, and for, it wasn't just, uh, there's a lot of reasons why it was shut down, I think, in the 70s. It's not just, you know, you can't blame it all on Timothy Leary, right? But, um, I mean, there was a lot of uh, other scandals involving other drug experimentation, you know, that was going on. They were just much looser about drug research then. And so it was, uh, part of it, they, uh, the psychedelic research got kind of lumped together with that, right? Right. Um, but well, yeah, there's some ugly political stuff too with the Nixon administration. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, that, that, that was, uh, that was not so much the research, but well included, that was more like, you know, the, the criminal the further criminalization or increasing, you know, criminal penalties. And that was totally political as, as most, you know, drug prohibition movements are, they're usually going after one, you know, deviant subculture, you know, whether it's, you know, Irishmen who drink too much in prohibition or. Yeah, right. <laughs> black jazz musicians or black right, or in in with Latino marijuana or, smokers and, yeah. yeah or you know mdma with ravers in the 80s it's always like one you know uh you know indians with you know the early laws against peyote and the uh, just reading this great book up on mescaline by the way by this guy mike j it's a fantastic book the history of mescaline just mescaline really yeah yeah i really recommend it it's uh just a beautiful work scholarly solid and uh Stuff I never realized, yeah, about the whole history of mescaline. Because which, which actually, you know, because mescaline was like the first psychedelic. I mean, the Germans were synthesizing mm -hmm. it back in the 19th century. So it was a, there's a whole earlier history of, of, of psychedelics with, with mescaline, which people kind of forget about. Yeah, I actually did it in the 80s. And I, I think I, if I recall, I liked it better than LSD. Um, yeah, the only time I ever did it was I, I actually was a reporter. I did it and I, I, was, I was allowed to go to a, a Native American church ceremony in a teepee on the Navajo reservation, which is, you know, they usually wouldn't let white people in, but uh, I was doing an article about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and the, there's a, a Supreme Court case around peyote with Native American church. And so they let me participate in that, which was just incredible. You know, that's the real thing, right? Mm, mm. That's the only time I've taken, I think that's the only time I've taken mescaline. Uh, I've never taken synthesized mescaline. So then we go into kind of a deep freeze culturally, but also in AA around psychedelics generally for, you know, I come along in AA in the nineties and it was a pretty, you know, taboo is sort of an understatement. I mean, I, I came around at a time where there were actually people that would say things like, if you did a holotropic breath work session, it was a relapse. <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, yeah, well, you know, if, LSD was never like, despite what Bill says in that letter about, you know, sending people out to AA meetings after they were given LSD. I mean, maybe that happened, but that all, if that happened, I think it only, happened in that around Osmond's, you know, research up in Canada. It wasn't like, it wasn't like LSD was ever like even talked about at AA meetings, right? So it wasn't like it was, it was shut down in AA. It was never really in AA. It was, it was just in Bill Wilson's mind, it was, had potential, but it was, um, I, I kind of question that even what he says in this letter. Um, you know, he did have, did have a tendency to overstate things too, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was a salesman, that, you know. <laughs> that recent book, um, that big giant fat book, Writing the Big Book, um, came out a little while ago, written by a, um, well, he's not a historian. He's a, oh, what is he? He's got some training. At any rate, what it becomes very evident in that book is that Bill Wilson was 
you know, it was kind of like myths being made. It was like a game of telephone. The stories keep getting told and they keep getting embellished and then they kind of get a ton of status of, of, of mythology. And yeah, he definitely had a way of, you know, the guy concludes the book with saying, Bill Wilson really is the founder of AA. Bob is kind of a tag along thing, but it's really Bill's oh, yeah. Yeah. personality and storytelling and, um, yeah, he's really the guy. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Well, of course, Ben, Ben, Doctor Bob, when he died in what the uh, fifties. Uh, so Bill was this, you know, when the whole LSD thing started, or uh, and when we, you know, really took off in the fifties. Well, it sort of took off first in the forties, but I mean, yeah, Bill was this for a long time. Bill was the only surviving founder. So, yeah. so just to bring it all the way up to now. Um, we see this this LSD psychotherapy or psychedelic psychotherapy coming back. Um, we're beginning to see a lot of money, a lot yeah. of big money, big, big money. money. Um, we seem to have been the scene seems to have learned from the '60s. There's a certain maturity about it now that there wasn't back then. However, I, I must admit I interact with some people who who I respect, who still have this kind of, this is the panacea. Right, right. Um, so that seems to be creeping back as well. Or I also talk to people who uh, valorize the, the psychedelic experience as the spiritual experience. Right. So I'm seeing, I am seeing some of these excessive tendencies. Are you, do you see the same thing? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I, I don't really see it with the people doing the research. I think they're pretty cautious. Um, I just think by, I mean, the ones that I, the ones that I, in changing our minds, the ones who I profile are the real serious researchers, right? That are, the last thing they want to do is come off as like Timothy Leary or, you know, Richard Alpert. Um, and that's, that's sincere. I mean, they really, uh, and, and they respect the power of these substances and they don't, and they, and they, don't think they should be decriminalized. Most of them, most of the, the a lot of, well, a lot of the researchers, there's a difference of opinion about that. But, um, but I think in the general kind of culture, you know, this, this new psychedelic culture of, of the younger people, same thing is happening in the sixties. It's, uh, you know, psychedelics are going to save the world, right? Right. And they obviously didn't save the world in the sixties and seventies, but look where we are now, right? <laughs> 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 so much for that. But, uh, you know, it's kind of a, it's like a natural thing is that when you first have this experience, when you radically change your consciousness and the way you see perceive reality, and uh, it seems and it is so profound that uh, you kind of lose your bearings. And it's so it's kind of understandable that people get, you know, become over enthusiastic about the potential and, uh, and there's sort of a natural kind of progression of people maturing, I think, as they, if they're, if they're working in this field or really exploring as a serious psychonaut in this, right. in these realms, but yeah, there's that initial rush. And then there are the people that want to make money off of it. So they're promoting it for, you know, their own reasons or power, or they're, they're you know, so-called shamans or whatever, you know, there's all kinds yeah. of, shamans. there's always been charlatans out there, but there, there, there's a whole new wave of charlatans and I would be very careful like going down to South America these days, you know, to <laughs> Peru to, on a vision quest. Um, and then what's happening is like, you know, and I'm actually all for decriminalization. I, I think all drugs should be decriminalized myself, but um, you know, uh, but there's this whole wave of, you know, like places like Oakland and Denver and Oregon that are, you know, decriminalizing in, to various extents, almost legalizing uh, mushrooms or maybe plant-based psychedelics. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how this all shakes out in the next five or 10 years. Um, yeah, the thing that gives me the real trepidation is the money and the way money, you know, corrupts and such, but we'll see. Yeah, I'm not sure how they're going to make money on, on the, this because the psychedelic therapy, it's the drug is not expensive. If you do it like in the way that they're doing the clinical trials, it's the therapist's time that's the cost. Drug is really not that expensive and you don't take the drug that much. You, maybe you take no. the drug 
maybe you take the drug once, two or three times and that's it, right? If you're being treated say like for PTSD with MDMA, there's not a lot of money for the drug company to make. Uh, so that's why they're kind of trying to develop, like with ketamine, they're trying to develop like, you know, a nasal spray for ketamine with depression, which is different than other psychedelics, but they're, they're trying to find ways to, <laughs> to make it so it's marketable. So you have to take it every day, right? Yeah, that's, that's so <laughs> curious. And, and, and taking out the, 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 the psychoactive thing is seen as a side effect that has to be removed, whereas right. most psychedelic therapists think the psychedelic effect, the, the psychoactive thing is the effect, not the side effect, right? Right. But there may be some value, I, but at the same time, I, I try to be open-minded. There may be chemically, you know, something in ketamine or something in other psychedelics that at a lower dose could help people, you know? I mean, there. that's why you do research, right? To try to yeah. see the case, so. But it's certainly not looking like lifelong consumers on a daily basis, like a lot of psych meds are. Right, and the people, and then you ask the question, who will, speaking of money, who has the most to lose? Well, it's the drug companies if they people stop taking antidepressants. Right. You know, which are a huge industry. Then, so that's one reason I think the big pharma is trying to get into it because they, they're seeing it as a, it, even if they're not profiting from it, if it is as effective as some of this early research is showing, uh, it's going to uh, undermine the market for mainstream antidepressants. So, and also a lot of the a lot of a lot of the psychiatric medications are contraindicated with psychedelics. So there's some psychedelics they're going to want you off of the meds before you do your therapy. Exactly right, right. Like with yeah, yeah MA the, with like ayahuasca and yeah. 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 Um, well, this has been really, really good. Um, I think good. the audience is going to find this really interesting. I think you've done a great service to the recovery community by filling in some of the gaps, you know, speaking to some of the things that are hard to get the intel on. Um, you're definitely a journalist. <laughs> I can see the tenacity of a journalist here. Guilty as charged. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of semi-retired now, so I'm not out there. I'm, I'm too lazy to be a real good journalist anymore, but <laughs> I can't keep up, you know. Uh, yeah. Where can people find uh, your work and stuff about your, your current interest and in writings? Yeah, well, I have a website. Um, that's probably the best place to go, which is uh, my name, which is Don Latin, D-O-N-L-A-T-T-I-N.com. And it has you know, information about all my books, some articles I've written and a new project I'm doing, which has nothing to do with this. Uh, so um, that's the best place to go. Um, and the, you know, the books are available. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're Harper Collins published Harvard Psychedelic Club, UC Press, uh, Distilled Spirits and Synergetic Press, Changing Our Minds. So the books are available. You can, or, you know, order them from any bookstore, order them from even Amazon if you must. <laughs> I always encourage people to go to their, local independent bookseller and spend a little more money and keep them in business. <laughs> That's right. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed reading both of them, so. That's great. Well, thanks so much for having me on the program. Thank you, and I, I hope to talk again. Okay, adios.